If you haven't done so yet, please pause the video and try to answer the question on your own before listening on. In this question, we are being asked to calculate the magnitude of the electric field at this point P right here that is produced by these two point charges. And so it's going to be useful to look at the equation that gives the electric field produced by point charges. And according to that equation, the electric field is equal to a constant multiplied by the magnitude of the charge divided by a distance squared. In this case, the distance will be from each charge to the point P. Now, before we use this equation, it's going to be helpful to draw the direction of the two electric fields that are being produced by those charges. The charge indicated right here is positive, and we know that positive charges produce electric fields that point away from the positive charge. So over here at point P, we're going to point an electric field vector away from that positive charge. And since it's pointing away from the positive charge, we're going to have to put an arrowhead right about there. Negative charges produce electric fields that point towards the negative charge. So over here at point P, we're going to draw an electric field vector that points towards that negative charge. And since it's pointing towards the negative charge, we can put an arrowhead right here. Now perhaps we can call this first electric field E1, and then the second electric field can be E2. And in that case, we'll have to call this charge Q1 and this charge Q2, just to keep track of things. Now because the magnitude of charge is the same on these two charges, we should actually show these vectors of being equal length. So we'll just fix the picture up a little bit. Next, we'll have to break these two electric fields into their x and y components. And the reason for that is because electric fields are known as vector quantities. So when we add them together, we have to add the x components separately from the y components. So we'll go ahead and draw in the x and y components. For example, for E1, we have an x component that's pointing to the right, and then the y component is pointing down. And then for E2, the x component is pointing to the left, and the y component is also pointing down. Hopefully we can see from the diagram that the x component of E1, which is pointing to the right, is going to cancel with the x component of E2, which is pointing to the left. And because they cancel, we can basically take them out of the problem. And so the only components that matter will be the y components, which we will leave in the diagram. Now if we look at our diagram carefully, we can see that we have two right triangles. We have the one that's outlined right here, and then the other one outlined over here. And what we're going to do is mark an angle inside of each triangle, and we'll call that angle theta. So we'll put that theta right here, and then also right here. Now because the y components are located opposite of the angle, we know that they can be expressed using the sine of theta. And so we're going to mark this y component right here as E2 sine theta, and then this y component is E1 sine theta. Again, we're using sine because these y components are located opposite to the angle theta. If they were adjacent, we would be using cosine. So now when we go to write out the total electric field, which we can symbolize as sigma E, we're simply going to add these two y components together. So we're going to have E1 sine of theta plus E2 sine of theta. And of course, we recall from earlier that E is equal to KQ divided by R squared. So we're going to fill that in for E1 as well as for E2. We also recall that the magnitude of the charge Q1 and the magnitude of the charge Q2 are the same. They have opposite signs, but their magnitudes are the same. So we really don't even need to put in the symbols 1 and 2 since those magnitudes are indeed the same. And then we can see we have two like terms. So this can actually be condensed in the following manner. Now let us recall that the distance r that's marked in this equation is not the distance r that's marked in the diagram. What that distance r in the equation is supposed to be is the distance from each charge to the point P. So it's going to be this distance right here, as well as this distance right here. Now those distances are the same from the symmetry of the figure, so our goal becomes to find this distance, which again is the r that's present in this formula right here. And to do that, we're going to notice that we have yet another right triangle. So here is that triangle that's outlined right here. Now we've relabeled the hypotenuse c, just so we don't get the distance in the equation confused with the distance that was originally marked in the figure. Our goal is to find this distance that we have marked c, so we'll use the Pythagorean theorem. 
So we've set up the Pythagorean theorem, and then when we solve for c, we would take the square root of the right-hand side. And this becomes the distance that we were seeking. So we'll label that distance in the diagram. So now that we have the distance from the charge to the point that was marked p, we can plug that distance into the equation for the r value. So there is that distance. Now because that distance is being squared, we can actually take away the square root because the square root is going to cancel with that squaring. We move on to the term that says sine of theta. Remember, theta was marked in our original diagram right here. And we know that the sine of theta is the opposite side over the hypotenuse. The opposite to theta is d over 2. And the hypotenuse is this square root term right here. This expression can be cleaned up just a little bit. You'll notice we have a 2 right here multiplied by essentially a 1 half. And 2 times 1 half is just 1, so those are going to cancel. The denominators can be simplified as well. We know that this term right here is all being raised to the 1, whereas on the right term, it's being raised to the 1 half because of this square root. And of course, when we multiply these together, we can add those exponents. And so the exponent of 1 plus 1 half will become 3 halves. And so here is the final expression for the total electric field produced at point P. We can now simply plug in the known values. The r has to be changed into meters, so we're going to take the 9.86 and multiply it by 10 to the minus 2. And so with that change, we'll plug in all the known values. So after plugging in the known values and carefully typing that into your calculator, you should get approximately 91.4, and then the standard unit of electric field is newtons per coulomb. So this becomes the correct answer. Notice for k, we plugged in the constant value of 8.99 times 10 to the ninth.